Uh, and we're going to ask our panelists the question, what would you change? I tell you, I'm going to go with Adela first because okay. she actually, she and I chatted in the hall. So we're going to go Adela and then T, and then we're just going to go around the, around the, uh, the table, if that's okay with you. So we're going to, because uh, I want to get, I want to get the voice of the young person for as early as possible, and then we'll go to the other things. So, uh, Adela, why don't you go ahead and start? Thank you. I, well, kind of what we talked about a little bit was that how we moved around in the paperwork, but in, it kind of goes in the way of how it actually happens sometimes in, in the world of, you know, making decisions for the child and where should she go, what system should she be. In the paperwork here, we moved on and kind of forgot about her being in custody. You know, so we didn't talk about what has been the process for her while she's been in custody, who has been checking in with her, her stages of changes while she's been in, the, in custody. I mean, it's contained. So definitely for a lot of our girls, or a lot of our youth, when you're contained, there's a lot because all you could do is think about the situation, the situation that got you there, what happened in the past, what's happening in the future, not knowing what's going to happen with your future because the conversations that you just heard are the conversations that are happening. And yet she's just wondering what's going to happen. Um, she knows she may go, she may be placed. She knows she may not go back to foster care. She knows that she may go into a probation placement, but she's not currently fully understanding the whole process. So definitely you have, um, you have providers, myself or, you know, Pat, um, the attorneys, some people trying to come and see her and explain the situation as much as we possibly can, but it's still very confusing. It's still um, a situation that they're afraid and they don't understand, you know, and they're vulnerable again because they don't know what's going to happen. Um, you, so what would you change to make it less so for her or to make it more so in the sense of her um, having less, uh, um, having more uh, assurance is that the word I'm looking for? What would you do? What would you change? I think um, as we're starting to see, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, so there's been a lot of progress from back in 2005 where there was no progress. There was nothing. There was no communication. So uh, there is movement. Yes, we, there still need to be more movement to be made in regards to more advocating for the youth and understanding where they are while they are rejecting services or while they are refusing to go to placement, they're still a youth and they're still basically brainwashed. They're still programmed. You know, they, these are youth who, whose identity was taken. They're not Yvonne. They're not the other young lady, Keisha. You know, they're whatever street name they were used. I mean, you have to get to the person. You have to get to Keisha because right now she's putting you Candy Girl, whoever her name is in the street, and that's the persona that she's given to you because she's not knowing how to trust you or who are you or what are you gonna, like T, sa like T says, basically people are engaging with these youth and they have a motive. So they're trying to see what kind of motive do you have? Are you gonna, and they're gonna test you to see whether you're gonna be another person who's gonna come in their life and fail them. So definitely more advocating for the youth and, and questioning them. How are you doing? What's going on? What do you think helps you? What works from you? Understanding that it's okay if you want to go live with your mom, but guess what? It's not right at the moment. She will always be your mom. You're just going to have to love her from a distance. And meeting them where they are and acknowledging whatever they need. You <laughs> Excuse me. I'm going to have to cut you a little short. And I'm going to challenge everybody, if you would, to if, if you can. <coughs> this, is the, this is the Twitter version of what you'd like to see uh, done. So you got it done, 144 characters or less. So T, you got 144 characters. Oh my God. <laughs> 12 times 12, man. Is it 144? Is that 140. 100, oh, I said it's 12 times 12 minus four. Can we count two? No, just say it, just okay, say it. Okay, I was yeah, just gonna say, count it. Um, uh, as a young person, you to avoid labeling me is very important. Um, understanding that I'm just trying to live, I'm just trying to survive, and to understand that, yes, there is, you know, opportunities uh, to catch the person who's probably the exploiter, but also understanding that by people buying me, I'm being exploited too, so that, so that we need to understand that I, as a young person, I'm trying to live, but the people that buy me are willingly breaking the law, and they know what's going on, so understanding that that needs to be changed, this shift in uh, the lens in which we view this. Um, detention does not equal prevention for me. You just kind of put me in a room, lock me up in a kennel, like like a kennel, you know, a dog in a kennel pretty much type thing. Um, 
you've isolated me just as much as my exploiter does. So t detention does not equal prevention. Um, looking more so into regards to whether they're in child welfare or not in child welfare, I definitely agree that the assessment center model is amazing and the perspectives of that it has a safety component where it keeps the kids safe. It's, you know, monitored by police and it's a lock in, locked out facility, but you're not locked in. And that, for a young person, doesn't make me feel like I'm trapped again, um, but it does give me a, a opportunity to meet with the nurse, meet with someone for mental health, get a bite to eat, take a shower, breathe for a minute, grab some sweats, and, you know, in the end of it all, if I want to run away again, at least I got somebody to check in and have some type of follow-up with me. Um, and then understanding that with, you know, the good programs that allow young people to go into you know, whether it's like Minas Mountain or wherever that is, um, understanding that within those programs, we should um, encourage reassimilation uh, models in regards to how the young people are going to reassimilate. I echo the judge in regards to aftercare, aftercare, aftercare. Um, and really what it all boils down to, in, a, in addition to the trauma-informed services that they need to get, they also, I, I as a young person in Keisha or Yvonne, I need a connection, some type of connection to somebody. So I need community, and I need assistance in building that, and I'm, I'm hoping to, to find that. And so, Period. That was one, one sentence. Thank you very much. That's great. Sorry. No, 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 that's great. So, Pat, we're going to go with you. Next. Uh, I would change, uh, um, I'd change some of the protocols and procedures that are in place. Uh, over the years, uh, certain agencies and systems have run off protocols that really don't work with this population. And to... Um, for the decision-making process, I'll, I'll say. Um, it's relationship-based right now. Some decisions have to be made at, at, in a moment's notice, and um, there's really no, no protocol on how we do it. So what we do is we call who we know, and we have to be, happen to be fortunate to know everyone uh, who's in a place to make a decision, and it should be spelled out for anyone that... Uh, if Pat Mims isn't there that day, uh, someone else is in my shoes, they'd be able to make that call as well. So, so you're having to make the calls unilaterally? Uh, that is at, to say, just you making the call? Uh, at times, yeah. it's me making okay. the call uh, because I happen to have the cell phone of the people to make the decision. And I'm saying that there are other service providers that are in the field who... Uh, would be able to make a safe decision uh, for a child who may not have that phone number, and they would have to go to that line that puts them on hold. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Michelle. So I think what I would say, um, and I think as things begin to change in California, that as we begin to hear a lot that child welfare is responsible, that we resource the child welfare system to do the work. I think people forget that. And it isn't just money for staffing. It is money for training and the ability for me to be able to mandate training. I, you know, I deal with labor systems. I can't mandate any training. I can strongly encourage people to go to training. We need more service providers that are able to do this work. We have three quality providers that are really in tune to the CSEC work in Alameda County. That is a not enough for all the youth that really need those services. I need placements and I need treatment and I need foster parents. So all the people that are interested in working with these youth, they also need to step up and say they can come stay with me because youth don't need to be in group homes. I would like another assessment center or two. T is right. We have come up with a good model and we've changed some things at the assessment center because of T's suggestions. But I would like to have another assessment center or two. Um, and lastly, I would like the requirement that we aren't left out there alone, that every provider, that probation actively sits at the table with us. The DA is already present, but it is relationship-based, so that when Jennifer gets promoted or Nancy or O'Malley decides to leave, that it is truly this is the work, and it doesn't matter who the relationship is with, that this is how we do it, that mental health is required to sit at the table, that it isn't that... Um, we are left holding the bag with an MDT that no one is required to be there but child welfare. So, 
Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, uh, let's let's skip over to Leslie and then uh, Justice Bridge. If we can, can we come back to you at the end and you can uh, from your perspective, which is a little bit you know different. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. T said most of what I was going to say, but I thought of some new things. Um, I would say the first thing that I would change is that we need to pass AB 2035 so that we're not confused about the law at all. Um, we need to patch, pass the Child Welfare Budget Amendment about CSEC services. Agree with Michelle, we need to be resourced. Um, <laughs> and then I think that we need to... Um, rethink our interaction with youth as not, it's not a nine to five. It's a 24 hour in the moment um, plan, system, relationship, whatever it may be, but it has to be in the moment and it has to be available 24 seven. I think someone made a comment about not having the doctor's cell phone. So we have to create a way for, our, for the youth to actually have our cell phone numbers so that, and we have to answer them. Um, and that's not going to be in everybody's job description, but we have to find those and create the, that resource that. Um, and then lastly, I would say that um, the youth have to have access not just to an advocate and a medical care person, but a lawyer, because the one difference about their lawyer is that we have a 100% confidential relationship. It's not almost confidential, and it's not confidential except for A, B, or C. It's confidential. And that changes the dynamic, and it changes the relationship. Thank you. Jennifer. So I have three very concrete things on my wish list. One, I would like to have a more expedited process for placement. Um, and as Judge Burgess said and other people commented on, it can often be three or four months. So while a young lady may have bought into the, the idea of going by the time that you know 90 days hits or 120 days hits and she's in one unit with 30 other girls, there's a lot going on. So I would like that to be a much more expedited process. I would also like to have dedicated girls court probation officers, and that's something that, as I understand, probation is working on, but that's a conversation that we've been having ever since I got here in 2011. And I think it's imperative to have one probation officer from the start of the case to the finish who is trained, who understands the trauma that these young ladies deal with, who are going to take the extra step to do things such as talk to the young lady about what it's like to get on a plane. We have 15 or 16 year olds that are going to placement or have gone to placement and they've never been on planes before and it's a very scary process for them. Or they want to know what does this place look like? So showing them pictures, really thoroughly explaining to them everything that's going on so that it doesn't seem like such a scary experience. And finally, the last thing that I would want is safe housing, not only for C-sex but for transitional age young ladies who are you know, um, exploited as well. I think that that could be a viable option to safety detentions. And I also think that the age group of 18 to 21, this is a very vulnerable population. Because what I don't want to happen is that they graduate to the adult criminal system. You know, what we try to do is really minimize the recidivism in the uh, juvenile system. But I'm seeing, you know, quite a few of our young ladies who are getting adult offenses. And so at least if we could provide stable housing and other services for that group, um, I think that we'd be doing a wonderful thing. Thank you. Judge Burgess. Well, I think a lot of people have said a number of the things that I would. I think a number of the things that Michelle said, having more placements, having local placements. But I think one of the really big things is that we don't have child exploitation without demand. You know, And so what we need to do is we really need to focus on the demand. We need to crack down on demand. And I know that those are some of the things that the district attorney's office in this county is doing. But you know, we talk about child exploitation in Thailand and all these places outside of the USA. And we've got it going on full swing here, right in our backyard. And so we, we won't have this problem if we jump on top of and we have a culture a culture change, just like we did about, you know, domestic violence and drunk driving and all of those things. We need to really look at um, this issue because if we can avoid all of this trauma and all of this need for placements and all of this stuff, if we can, child exploitation doesn't exist without demand. So there are people out there who are looking for children and to exploit them. So that's what we really, I think, need to focus on. Thank you, and Dr. Mays. Um, I agree with Judge Burgess around culture change, and I think having a global culture change around how we view CSEC and viewing them from all every discipline as victims, always, 100% um, of the time, so that we can, uh, and, and not in a punitive way. Um, I think that every um, department that's 
uh, that's here is really necessary, but I think having the the, with the mindset of that they, they are victims. And so we when services are put in place, it is in a multidisciplinary way where we have people from um, juvenile justice and from child welfare and from medical and from uh, the school department, everyone working together, but from the vantage point that we are working with victims. And for youth to know that so that when they are picked up on the streets by the police, it's to rescue them and not to punish them. Um, when they are seen in court, is to support them and figure out where we're gonna place them and have them in a safe place and not to punish them. Um, when they're seen in the medical department, it is to help them around whatever the medical issues are and not to judge them because they are victims always. Can yeah. I say one more thing, if you, sure. you mind? Sure. I just wanted to say that, um, just following up on regards to what everybody said, I think that um, in regards to the work that we do, policies, procedures, all of that, um, it, it's about shifting the lens. And not only understanding this as, you know, domestic minor sex trafficking, but seeing these these children, they are children, and this is child rape. And seeing it as such, and, and, and really giving them and granting them the rights of, of what victims of, cri of crimes, you know, get. And so just shifting the lens. And also, I just want to echo, because Leslie, big ups, public defenders are rock stars. And the confidentiality shifts in the way I, as a young person, would respond or, or interact in regards to a seeking help. Um, and then lastly, just in regards to understanding whether these kids are or are not in, in CPS, having the ability to make these CPS... Um, these CPS reports, um, again, going back to the issue, the issue or the, the hypothetical situation that I, I said about Keisha, who didn't self-identify, given the thing, um, basically saying that with these CPS reports, if it's, it's not the parents or the uh, or some main exploiter that's putting them at risk for being exploited, but just being the vulnerabilities of living in poverty, we should access some of our other um, gateways such as I know C child, you know, social service agency has another road to safety services, things that can actually help, you know, build foundation within families. Terrific. Now it's your turn. Um, what just, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. Just, yes. My mistake. Please. Justice bridge. You put, uh, you put me in a terrible position, <laughs> but, um, I'll take the challenge and just say that, um, obviously the replication of great practices, which you've heard about here in the first part of this panel, and then you've heard sort of emphasized, um, as each person has spoken, I don't disagree with any of this. So let me just come up with a, with a, um, maybe 35,000 foot, um, all of this stuff, um, can happen without two things. First of all, culture change, and that means the demand, the whole domestic violence kind of cycle that we've gone through, or even smoking in public or seat belts. I mean, we've done it before and we can do it again. The second thing, however, is, is that with all this good practice, uh, with all this change in attitude, we really have to embed this in our systems, in our institutions, because it will not last, it will not stay, uh, it will not stick, and so that needs to be reflected. Uh, which means that we break down the barriers between juvenile justice and child welfare. We recognize this as child rape. Juvenile justice and child welfare are, chain, are, are sharing resources. There's really a sort of seamless CSEC that is the, that is the, the situation that we're dealing with, the, per, the person that we are dealing with. We decriminalize it. That's not saying juvenile justice is going to be out of it because they're going to present with other kinds of crimes like, you know, like we've been talking about. You know, they're, they're most likely to walk through your door as being you know, someone with drugs or someone who's been shoplifting or something that is, that is not being the victim of a rape. And so decriminalize and then acknowledge that child welfare is the responsible place because if this is not child abuse, I don't know what the hell is. And so... Therefore, they take the lead, but they're properly resourced, and we have these multidisciplinary teams and everyone at the table who can have the re the um, who can add to the services because the attitude is uh, that we are looking at the um, the the well-being of this child and not anything else. That's our first and foremost responsibility. All right, now it's your turn. Because the whole point of this was to put this out to you in terms of the issues that need to be raised, the what's happening now, but to help you begin to think through about what it should look like in the future for Alameda County. 
So this is your opportunity to ask the question that you didn't ask while someone was speaking or to raise the issue that you don't think got raised. Who'd like? And I'm, you know, rather than have, you, you want to have them come up? Or might get, let's just pass the mics around. It might be easier that way. Here. Let's, yeah, do it this way. A couple of questions. One is I hear about dependency court and I hear about juvenile court, but I don't hear anything about family court. And there's an awful lot of kids that come through the, the family court system that actually could um, partner, I wonder, could not partner up in some way. When you think about this as a family problem or a component of it as a family problem, are we not missing out on using or thinking about using or how to use the family court mediation process. The other question I had was, is there any value in doing something in a preventative way that takes a look at the other end of the continuum around when they're preschoolers and toddlers and providing supportive services, conversations to parents about how to think about the future with kids and risk factors that can um, be a part of the fabric of their lives. Who, yeah, who'd like to take that? I think that's a part of the culture change that we're talking about. And with regard to the first part of your question, I mean, with uh, when you talk about child welfare and you talk about the dependency court, there are certain ways that you enter those systems in terms of petitions that are filed. It's kind of different in terms of the family court, but I'm sure you see pieces and parts of those types of situations in the family court. I can't really speak to that so much, though. Uh, but I think that, that that question that you raise, which, which is the preventative one, and being able to jump on top of these things early is a part of our culture shift. It's a part of all of our responsibility um, in terms of being able to shift and understand that um, these kids are victims. So, great. I think also in regards to the preventative and the culture change is the fact that you need to add more education, more education to the schools, to the clinics, more places that can identify and can pick up some of these risk factors. I mean, we are, you know, in these two systems, independency or juvenile, you're kind of sort of depending that the school, the SARS, will know that these kids are not going to school or, you know, coming with changes. So you're hoping that they will raise it up so it could bring to the attention of others. So the more education, more people are aware of how to identify, you know, the risk factors that may be happening or challenges that they may be happening with the family, with the youth. I think the services or, you know, the response will be differently. Training. Hi, my name is Lena Avidan. I manage immigrant integration grant making at the Zellerbach Family Foundation. So this is really a, a new thing for me. But I'm curious if in Oakland, if it's a regular part of both the screening and the referral process to identify whether or not young women may be non-citizens, and if so, to refer them for immigration legal services, because there are some really excellent opportunities in that area for, for un undocumented youth and um, other immigrant kids. Okay, so uh, we're, well, we're currently screening, like I said, in our school health centers. We don't ask about immigration status. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of making me think about, just your question is making me think about something, that, maybe a change that we, could, we can make um, around uh, how, to, how to support youth who um, also are, are, not, are not from here and, and may have immigration issues. I don't know if, um, that I can really uh, answer that. I think that immigration issues, we, we do have those issues certainly that come up uh, often in the de delinquency court, the dependency court. I know that uh, those issues, we, we've had um, trainings where we've had Im immigration lawyers come in to assist us with the types of problems that come up and issues that come up uh, with regard to uh, kids who are from other countries. I know that the public defender in our, in our county has a contract with an immigration uh, lawyer firm and they bring those folks in to assist them with those types of issues. It's extremely complex, very complex and always changing uh, in terms of the law in that area. So. You know, I, I don't, I'm, certain, I'm certain that we're not up to snuff in terms of dealing with that in the way that we would like to in the, in the perfect world, but those issues do present themselves. Uh, we address them. Uh, do we address them completely adequately? I would probably say no. Um, 
so a little differently in both in Los Angeles and, well, once the child's in the dependency system, um, we actually do have a very good straight line process to, for, for undocumented youth um, and, in, and are able to get them residency. Um, and it's pretty straightforward and it, it works. <laughs> in Los Angeles, the Department of Children and Family Services has a special immigration unit and they process all the paperwork working with the feds to get everything done and it actually works extremely well. It's one of the things that LA DCFS does the best. Um, and in Sacramento, we rely on pro bono attorneys or attorneys that will provide us with very reduced rates um, to handle the paperwork that's involved in getting a dependent youth legalization. So. Um, once they're in the dependency system, it's actually pretty good. In Alameda County, we do the same thing. We try to ensure that before a youth reaches 18 that we have addressed residency issues. We don't ask at screening, though, and we try to be mindful of people that may be wary of their undocumented status reporting, so that isn't a question. That is ask at intake. Anna, you have a... Somebody has a question? I, well, I have some that people oh, wrote good, down, good. so maybe I'll ask one of these, and then we'll take the next one from the audience. So um, this first one here, um, sort of what has been panelists' experience with um, first male children who are trafficked, and then um, women who are either pimps or buyers of children, so um, women on the demand and uh, trafficking side. So I don't know if there's anybody who wants to an answer that. So in Safety Net, we have um, three, I believe, three boys that we've um, reviewed. And I think that what they've been engaged in would be um, considered uh, survival sex. Um, so they may not necessarily have a pimp, but, um, you know, they are selling their bodies for various things. We had one particular case in which there was a young boy who, um, well, he was 16, and he um, answered a Craigslist ad to be a houseboy. And so he and his mother moved into a situation, and it resulted in multiple charges of very serious sexual assault offenses. Um, in terms of women who are involved, I think that I, I have seen that over the years. Um, definitely um, not as much. I would say that most of the pimps or exploiters that I've dealt with have been men, but I've definitely seen some. It could be a mother. Um, it could be another relative who is basically exploiting their own child, and the child is the only one bringing you know, money into the home. But it's, it's, it's rare in my experience. I agree. I agree with that as well. The one, one boy that, I, um, that we uncovered in screening um, was having sex with an older man, and he was staying with him, and the man's paying for things and buying him a computer. And he actually mentioned an iPod that he wanted. And so having this exchange for, for goods or a place to stay and not, did, he didn't consider himself being exploited. He, this was his choice and something he was doing to take care of himself, so. So I was gonna say, so there's, I mean, there's very different categories that, you know, these youth can be identified as. Um, we're also talking about, you know, how they identified, you know, in their status in regards to their LGBTQ. These are kids who are homeless, thrown away, kids who are doing it as a survival, but at the same time have no other choice but to engage in those relationships because they have nowhere else to go. Um, and th even though they say they, you know, they choose to do it, it's still someone taking advantage of them, someone taking advantage of their vulnerability and using their vulnerability for their own benefit of sexual gratification. We're still talking about children who are being taken advantage of. Um, yes, it's it does happen. It doesn't happen in a track in you know like international, but it does happen in certain tracks in certain areas. I mean, you will still see these young men out there. You will see these young men who identify as females out there. Um, and in regards to um, the women exploitation. A lot of the young girls are in the training brainwash and everything program that, you know, they are programmed to go out and get more girls. So you will see that another girl will recruit another girl. And this is not that she wants her, you know, to really engage in the services, but it's also about less beatings that this she will get, less harder that she will have to work because she, was, she brought someone else who can help out. Or maybe, you know, she'll be in a better uh, position with this person. That's why, you know, she's considered the bottom girl, which again, is another mental thing. You would think she'll be the top girl. No, she's the bottom girl, you know, so 
definitely you will have a female who will exploit another female, but they're all in the same predicament. They're all trying to survive. Will she grow up as an adult and maybe exploit others? Yes, maybe if she doesn't get the adequate support and services that she needs. But it's, it's all a psychological cycle that this person is doing. It's not, you know, it's based on them trying to survive. Team. And then let's see, we have another uh, question. Okay, one, two, one, two, three. How's it four? I okay. was going to be very quick because Adela said the part about the women part that I wanted to. First of all, whoever wrote this question, big ups, because I think that there needs to be acknowledgement more about both the young women and the young men. Um, but what I was going to say was that oftentimes what I've noticed as an advocate working in Alameda County is that when we have a young person who, um, it, and I think of a, a person specifically, who we utilize all the services that we have, you know, we tr there's very few services that actually help assist boys in this capacity. So understanding that as well and understanding that when you, you know, try to reach out, you've sent the child to children in the night, they run home, run away, or you try to do um, intensive, I mean, it, therapeutic foster care or whatever you try to do, um, understanding that the bigger picture and the bigger problem in this whole issue is that there are limited, very limited gender-specific services for these young men. Hi. Um, how does C-sex being placed in juvenile hall impact the cases um, against their pimps, the prosecution's cases against the pimps? Um, and what are the circumstances surrounding when C-sex are asked to testify against their exploiters? So if they're being detained, I mean, the, the, the one thing, well, a couple of things that we have to think about, and the head of that unit, actually, Casey Bates, is here, who actually supervises um, the prosecutors, the victim witness, and the inspector who handles the adult heat cases. Um, but there are a couple considerations. One, we want to make sure that they're having adequate support while they're being detained, and then there's also the question of how are they going to be transported when they're going to be testifying, and what supports are they going to have not only before but actually during and then after. Um, and the second question was, so like what you said, what are the circumstances? So, I mean, if there's information that the adult heat unit develops um, independently or through another amount of, let's say, another source, um, at some point law enforcement will go in and talk to them in custody and what the protocol, what should happen ideally is that one, the defense attorney should be contacted. Um, we don't want a situation necessarily in which law enforcement is going in without their attorney knowing about it. The attorney is there, and there also can be support people who are there as well. So that, you know, maybe the first, and when I say law enforcement, I'm talking about the police. At some point, someone from our office will talk to them as well. But the first conversation is going to be not, let's get directly into the facts, but it's going to be, this is who I am, this is what's going to happen. Um, are they ever forced to testify? They're not forced to testify. There are certain situations where just having the girls there in the room, um, where, when the pimp is there, will lead to the pimp taking a plea, um, which you know we understand. We've ha we have girls that have multiple pimps. So if there are three or four pimps, um, it may not be an ideal situation for her to tell the story over and over and over again. I would say that it's very case specific, and it just depends on the situation. Um, what her mental health needs are, kind of her emotional issues. If she's mentally fragile at that point, are we going to put her on to testify in front of her pimp? Um, probably not. Um, so it really just depends on the individual situation. Did you want? Uh, let's let T uh, weigh in. I was just going to say, um, you know, with some girls, they're, they're willing participants. With a lot of them, there is a lot of apprehension because there is a lot of danger in regards to testifying against your pimp because not only are you testifying against one individual person you're testifying against his community and everybody's going to know once once the cat you know once the stuff hits the fan so um you know uh, understanding that i think that we have to really look at how we're asking and again it's a shift in the lens and how we even you know go to get the testimony so really looking at if we can start to engage in um and again, it's a bigger bureaucratical issue in regards to like if we can bring in like videotape testimony, things like that. Um, because and and really ensuring the young person 
and and that's the thing is that's that's what it is is that you'll have a lot of apprehension of that young person because it goes down to this is really basic safety and it's like no matter what police you bring in no matter what well where was the police when I needed when I got in this situation in the first place so you know unfortunately as we would like to see you know exploiters be put put to bed there is a lot of apprehension because and also you have uh, Stockholm syndrome which which plays in it's like why am I going to testify although yeah you're telling me that this is a bad person um, why am I going to testify against the one person that, you know, whether he did me good or bad or wrong, he still always accepted me back with open arms. So just understanding that mental capacity of testifying. Okay, one thing and then... One thing, well, yeah. uh, another complicating situation is we've been talking about pimp and, um, and victim, if you will, but uh, at least in the state of Washington, and I assume here as well, um, some of the, um, the, the CSEC is happening through gangs, so actually it's a whole group, it's your whole community, and similar to the situation of being pimped out of your own home, which is also not uncommon. Um, it's probably a quarter and a quarter for each of those, and in some communities it varies as to what's, you know, what's, um, what's the, uh, the, the, uh, the most predominant way in which um, CSEC is happening. So those just add really complicated issues from the standpoint of getting, uh, getting testimony. Could I just you have yeah, to figure I, out a way to prosecute them without victim testimony. Yeah. So Ms. I'm Shelley. Casey Bates. I'm the head of the Human Exploitation and Trafficking Unit. I uh, oversee the prosecution of the adult um, exploiters. And I just wanted to let everyone know that our perspective with respect to the prosecution of these cases is to, again, take a victim-centric approach <coughs> and acknowledge the fact that prosecuting a case and involving a victim in this is going to do a certain amount of damage to their mental health and hopefully at the end they'll come out stronger than they uh, you know went in but it's not an assured thing so we don't take this lightly and to the extent that we can prosecute a case um, without the victim we're always looking to try to do that through the use of technology cell phone records text messages images that are inappropriate that might be considered child pornography um, you know finding different ways to skin the cat, so to speak, um, is always something that we're looking to do. And we're very successful in that we maintain a uh, conviction rate that is always above 80 percent. And that's a function, I think, of the good work that we do at Safety Net in terms of keeping uh, people involved and cooperative in terms of their own case, and then looking for alternative ways to prosecute it. Casey? Yeah, sure, sure. The question had to do with the incidence of female exploiters. So I agree with what was said before, that we don't have many cases where we've prosecuted women for the actual exploitation as the pimp. But the areas of gray start to occur when we're looking at um, girls that were in the life that have sort of transitioned into a new role where they're considered the bottom. And where do you... I'm sorry, I was talking about women who buy the services. Oh. Well, I, let me, I would, I'll answer that, but okay. just since I had started this one thing, that's a real area of gray, you know, because we acknowledge the fact that they probably started as victims and they've evolved to a different place. And do you prosecute them because they're victims of human trafficking, and many of them are, but at what point does their behavior become so violent that they cross over into another area? And that is a, a really interesting, sad area of law. And then in terms of females buying, I'm not very familiar with that phenomenon. Yeah. Hannah, uh, let's see, I think Amy's next, and then we've got some other people. There's right back there, I think would be next. Oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, oh. What? 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 You're not going to say anything? Oh, T? Oh, I was just saying that. No, use the, use the microphone. <laughs> there, so. Hi. Despite the fact that you I don't need it. I was just saying it. in regards to, I think the question was in regards to, are there female customers? Yes. I can say that there, there is, and that's something that doesn't get enough light shined on at all. But yes, it does happen. What is a female John called? I don't know. Because a Jane. A Jean? Jean? Is it a Jane? Is it a Jane? No, okay, I don't know. Not Buddy. Okay. Not many. No, okay. Wait, let me get, uh, okay, real quick, and then, we, and then I want to get to Amy. And I want to comment one last thing in regards to the preparation for a case, because definitely uh, we have to take in consideration as you use, you know, the young lady or whoever the victim may be is going to be testifying against whoever has victimized her. 
the, I've had this conversation many times in Safety Net or with you know the DA in regards to the same way you prepare for your case, we need to prepare the, the victim because these cases can be very damaging in regards to their mental health. Um, we have had many different outcomes prior to the, you know, the testimony, after the testimony, and you definitely need to have these victims wrapped around with support systems, support services, providers, family, whoever it may be, because they will actually have a breakdown. It's you having them relive all the trauma that they've been through, all their rapes, all their beatings, and you have to, and, and they have to sit with it afterwards, because most of the time, a lot of these young women just go, 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 and they never think about it. But when they have to testify, they're actually putting themselves in those positions that that happened to them and have to come to terms that that was them that everything happened to and that's the other part that you have to deal with and you need to have that support after the testimony as well critical Amy okay hi thank you I'm taking a u-turn with this question because it's recently come to my attention that there is a group or groups of people that are going around airports trying to educate passengers and airport personnel about the signs of child trafficking. And there was just an article in yesterday's Chronicle that there was a big training for um, airline personnel and I think TSA agents, I'm not sure who else, on being able to notice, identify the victims. Um, and oddly, this came from a colleague of mine or a friend who's a child welfare director in another county who ran across this group at Long Beach Airport. And then I read about it in the paper, but they were also talking about the idea of having airline personnel and flight crews become mandated reporters. And I was wondering whether that's something that anyone wants to comment on. Okay. Who's coming? T coming? In? Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, I actually live in D.C., and so really um, on a bigger federal scale, the Department of Transportation has been really active in regards to doing a lot of these works that you're talking about, the workshops, really, you know, on the ground, talking about Greyhound, things like that. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and then the second part you said was... Uh, mandated reporters. Mandated reporters. Yeah. Okay. I find that to be very tricky. Because I think that, again, you know, coming, you come, you know, so funny. I had a situation yesterday um, on a plane, and the flight attendant was like, well, you don't go to medical school before you go to flight school. You don't. So also understanding that when you talk about mandated reporting, if the, it's not trained and properly um, expressed in which which to report, it gets subjective. So just understanding that there can be some damage in that. And, you know, these are serious things. And so... You don't want to have someone that's not fully educated on making the report um, to do so. So, yeah. Sure. Coming over to Dr. Mays. So I think that uh, I think it's really interesting that that the conversation is now in the airports and talking with TSA and just because again there are so many different um, areas that traffic youth are showing up that are sort of the non-traditional, like not in child welfare, not in juvenile justice, but in every other place of life. And and um, I don't know if anyone here is from the South Bay, but um, down in San Mateo County, there's a big issue with um, the, the motels around the airport. And so like one of the biggest sort of sting operations that happened um, to uncover CSEC youth happened out of um, sort of the, the La Quinta uh, chain of hotels around the airport because there were specific trainings done with the motel staff around what is it, what, what might it look, um, how, how might it look for youth who are being trafficked. So young girls who are coming in with older men um, for short stays several times, diff same man with different girls, and there was a pretty successful sting operation that happened because a motel manager called the police after a training and they were able to come in and get the exploiter and also get the girls. So I think it is, um, it really speaks to um, training of the broader community in a responsible way um, to be able to um, uncover exploitation. So we have